Hello again. Good to be with you guys and uh, hope everything's been going really well as we tune back in to resume our lecture series. We just have uh, one more important lecture right now uh, to finish off our notes and um, information about the Japanese religious traditions. So I hope you've been keeping up with the lectures and all the different course material. Um, just a little reminder, please don't forget that the second essay assignment is due this week on Thursday by the end of the day, anytime at or before 11.59 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on Thursday. That's Thursday, May the 4th. Um, so be sure to send it in to me and make sure that you don't miss that assignment. That's an important one. Um, and then after that, you know, we're just going to be down to one more thing, which would be the final exam. I'll distribute a study guide for that, just how, the same way that I did for the midterm. And uh, we'll also have a review session that students are welcome to join if they are free on Zoom. Um, <clears throat> but that's, that's that. Also, um, I posted some uh, materials for everybody uh, yesterday to the Canvas. So make sure that you have a chance to go and read those documents. Those are just the uh, files for the text readings, uh, for the assigned readings, uh, for the things that come after we finish our survey of the major world religious traditions. So the next little unit of the course and the last unit of the course is a survey of different arguments that have been written throughout history, which try to make the argument that God exists or to try and prove that God exists. Um, so there's actually four big arguments that we're gonna review in there. One is the ontological argument by a uh, philosopher and theologian Saint Anselm. That's about a thousand years old, so it's got a rich history and it's been discussed a lot uh, over the last millennium. And then another argument that we'll talk about after that is the cosmological argument, which has very ancient roots. Um, there are versions of it that are written all the way back into the uh, ancient times before the Common Era. But we're going to look at a more modern uh, written version of it from American philosopher Richard Taylor uh, from 1963. And then um, another major argument for God's existence is known as the argument from design, sometimes academically referred to as the teleological argument. Um, that one, you know, it, it, there's a version of it that we will study written by a British philosopher, William Paley, back in the year 1800. And uh, then we're also going to look at one more argument after that, which tries to establish that uh, it's rational to believe in God, at least. And that is the Pascal's wager argument um, from 16. 60s, uh, written by the French philosopher Blaise Pascal. So those are four lessons, and uh, I distributed the four different um, assigned reading materials as PDF files so that you could simply read through those. That comes from another textbook that I have used in another class, uh, which is more focused on um, the philosophy of religion specifically. Um, so I'm integrating just a little bit of the philosophical review of arguments for God's existence just at the tail end of our class here, and that'll be one more course unit. Also, there's one short reading at the very end about um, criticisms and objections to those different arguments that try to prove that God exists. So we want to have balance and we want to see both sides of the debate. So together with studying these arguments that theists have given to try and make the case for God's existence, we'll also look at what are some objections and, um, you know, critical replies from those that didn't find these arguments persuasive or that found fault with them in whatever way. Okay, but um, that's what's coming next and just a few updates on the schedule. But one thing at a time, first thing first, uh, let's make sure we get to our last lesson today then on the Japanese religious traditions part three. Uh, but yes, just last word of reminder, please don't forget your second essay due this week by, thir uh, by the end of the day, Thursday. Uh, try not to wait till the absolute last minute to write it. That's when sometimes it gets harder to clear your thoughts and to just relax and write it in a natural way. If you need any help or any assistance of any type, just don't hesitate to reach out to me, and I'm happy to give you any guidance I could. Um, and also, you know, just don't forget about those journal entries. Hopefully you've been working on them as the semester goes on. Um, anybody that hasn't been submitting as many as they would have wanted, you know, the semester is still active, and you still have your opportunity to get that credit, but you have to just, you know, simply send me some easy breezy little baby journal articles, and then, you know, you're going to get good credit for those, but you have to do it if you want to do it. Anyway, though, today we're going to, as I say, wrap up our unit and notes on Japanese religious traditions. So this is the third and final lecture on this topic. <clears throat> okay. So, um, and by the way, the next uh, selected reading for the Thursday lecture that I will post um, coming forward on Wednesday, that's on the ontological argument. Please do read that uh, for that 
lecture. It's only a two-page article, so I know it's short. You should be able to get through it, uh, but it's very dense, so please take a little time to read that if you can. Okay, so again, Japanese religious traditions. The plan today uh, about these traditions is to cover these uh, areas of, of study or of, of research on the topic. So we're going to talk about the sacred spaces of the uh, Japanese religious traditions. We're going to talk about the sacred times, you know, holidays and uh, rites of passage and other auspicious uh, moments and times in the calendar, sacred times. We will then speak about death and the afterlife as the Japanese traditions see it. And then uh, finally, we'll close tonight with uh, society and religion at, as pertaining again to the, obviously the Japanese religious traditions. So that's our layout for major areas to focus on. And therefore, let us just begin. We'll start with our discussion then of the uh, sacred spaces of the Japanese traditions. So in Japanese religion, there are two main types of sacred religious structures. There's Buddhist temples and Shinto shrines. Buddhist temples in Japanese uh, vernacular are Otera. Okay, Otera, Buddhist temple. And the Japanese word for Shinto shrines is uh, Jinja. So, as we've learned, uh, Shinto and Various sects of Japanese Buddhism are the major forms of religious practice in Japan that have a lot of overlap and intersection between them. Um, but if you're focused on the Buddhist temple, house of worship, that's Otera, and the Shinto shrine, Jinja. And Japanese Buddhist temples are influenced by the style, architectural layout of the Chinese Buddhist temples. Early Japanese Buddhist monks uh, visited China, and then when they returned back to Japan, they brought back with them basic elements uh, of the temple design that they saw while they were abroad. They followed the Chinese custom of building them on mountains in many cases. As such, uh, the word uh, san or zan, these are just two different um, uh, translations of the word in Japanese that means mountain. Um, <clears throat> so you'll often see the appendage uh, san or zan attached to the end of the name of a Japanese Buddhist temple, even those that are not necessarily located on a mountain or that are on just level ground or at sea level, still often refer to with that, uh, you know, extra appendage at the end as a way to sort of give honor to the Chinese influence um, that these Japanese Buddhist temples were inspired by. The Buddhist temples in Japan are often a complex of buildings, not just one. So sort of think about like a monastery, which is going to have a, a, an inner sanctum and a lot of different rooms for people to congregate or to worship or to meditate, or maybe even a uh, close to home analogy, like a college campus. You've got the various classrooms, you've got administrative buildings, you've got like a student center, um, a library. So many of the Buddhist temple complexes in Japan are sort of laid out in that way, a series of buildings. Um, a campus, if you will, of buildings all focused around uh, composing the larger enclave there of uh, Buddhist temple worship and practice. So um, the main hall of the Otera is called the Kondo, with the letter K. So Kondo, that's just the main hall of the Otera, which is the Buddhist temple. Um, <clears throat> the Kondo, as, as we're calling the main hall, has sacred images of the Buddha, or maybe not just Buddha himself, could be other Buddhas or Bosatsus, Bodhisattvas in Japanese terminology. There's also another area within the um, complex of buildings in a Buddhist Otera. It's called the uh, Daikoro. <clears throat> Uh, Daikoro is just um, kind of like a lecture hall where sermon or, or talks are given on the religious subject of the day. <clears throat> so that's just another part of the Okara structure and complex. Um, 
There are also inner rooms that people use for storing religious items, and in some cases for even uh, a place of residence for resident monks that may stay there. Usually the Otero will feature a five-story pagoda structure. Um, in Japanese, the term for pagoda is uh, gojo no to, and that a pagoda is like a tiered tower-like structure which has multiple eaves hanging off of the various tiers. Uh, maybe I can show you a picture of one from our textbook just so you can get a sense of that. Well, there's not a great image in here, so let me just see if I can pull one up on the phone. <laughs> one second, and I'll just show it to the camera. So yeah, you see the um, multi-tiered structure here with a number of uh, eaves that extend outward from each of the tiers. That's a pagoda, um, and that's a distinctive feature that you'll often see in the Japanese Buddhist Oteras. Um, the pagoda would house sacred relics, and it's originally based on the concept of the stupa structures that were from the original Indian um, subcontinent and their way of uh, building temples to Buddhist practice. If there's enough land available where the Otera is built, then the complex would be surrounded by a nice garden. And these peaceful and tranquil gardens are sometimes themselves uh, the site of religious importance as places to meditate or to quietly sit and reflect or contemplate life. Especially in Zen Buddhism, there are many such gardens. And uh, I think these gardens are a good way of th thinking about that element of Zen, which says that we need to uh, meditate deeply and reflect, that's a better way to get to enlightenment than to use just logic and rational thought and the way of knowledge. Okay, so Zen is famously skeptical of the power of reason and language to articulate the deepest and most fundamental truths. So putting yourself in a nice natural setting where you can simply contemplate the natural beauty of a garden-like system and structure around you is, I think, revel revealing about um, the standpoint of uh, the Zen Buddhist practice. Now, one of the first Japanese Buddhist temple complexes, and most well-known, was originally built in 607 ACE um, by what some call the founder of Japanese Buddhism, that's Prince Shotoku. And uh, this complex that he built, um, it's a temple complex near the city of Nara. It's thought to be the oldest surviving uh, group of wooden buildings in the whole world. And this complex has been designated a national treasure by the Japanese government. Um, so that's, I guess, another notable fact that there's a Prince Shotoku built ancient Japanese uh, complex, Buddhist complex, uh, the oldest surviving group of wooden buildings in the world, and it's uh, one of the holiest sites in the Japanese Buddhist culture. Um, now, Shinto sacred houses, as we said, are called Jinja, and uh, those are shrines. They're usually a complex of many buildings as well. And they're almost always located in a natural setting, like so somewhere where you can see nature um, and uh, unspoiled by the advances of technology and urban life. The oldest Jinja were just open air spaces with no real uh, architectural buildings present. They would simply just be in a natural area surrounding some auspicious natural object, like maybe a tree or a stone or a waterfall. Um, but now and over time, you know, architectural elements were developed to, you know, give a place for people to congregate within and to worship or pray. Shrines with a roof, for example, start to become a common thing in the common era around the year zero in our calendar. Many Shinto shrines involve worship and veneration of deities, including um, the rice deities. And some even take on the physical appearance of uh, the storehouses for grain and rice. And uh, that sort of reminds us again of the supreme importance attached to the harvesting of rice in Japan's uh, history as a, a staple of uh, the diet uh, that was mastered in uh, pre-modern times and, of course, gave people sustenance and uh, the ability to survive and build more advanced uh, civilizations over, over the millennia. The two most ancient shrines in Shinto are also the most sacred and holy. Those are the Isa shrine, Ise, and the Izumo shrine. So, <clears throat> Ise.
Ise Shrine. And the other one, the Izumo Shrine. So let me just tell you a little bit about the, both of those. Um, the Ise Shrine is fascinating, I believe. It's been a destination for Shinto pilgrims for over a thousand years. It's actually a large complex of shrines that are located near the coast southeast of Nara, Japan. <clears throat> the holiest place in the entire Shinto religion is its um, inner sanctuary, which is known as the Naiku. So Naiku is just a Japanese word for the inner shrine of a Shinto temple. Um, and the inner shrine of the Ise shrine, so the shrine within a shrine, you know, the holiest part within it, is dedicated to the sun goddess, uh, Amaterasu. That's the highest god, the highest kami in the Shinto pantheon, the goddess of the sun. So, you know, in the holiest Shinto shrine that people have gone on difficult pilgrimages and journeys to for over a thousand years, when you get to the inner sanctum, the naiku, you would see the sacred image of the sun goddess, the highest god in uh, Shinto. There's also the outer shrine, um, which is called Geku. Okay. okay. So in the shrine of Ise, there's the inner shrine dedicated to the sun goddess. Um, about the sun goddess again, the most uh, important uh, divine figure in the entire Shinto religion because uh, she is supposed to be the original source of the imperial line that you know um, extends all the way into uh, current day Japan where there's a line of emperors that goes far back into prehistory. So they try to sort of connect again uh, secular power with divine roots and the sun goddess sort of standing at the uh, origins of that lineage is regarded as the most high divine being in the Shinto tradition. But again, there's also the Geku, which is the outer shrine of Ise. And that one's dedicated to the rice goddess, um, Toyuke Omakami. So, so the Ise shrine is fundamentally a shrine to these two major important deities in Shinto, the sun goddess, Amaterasu, and then the rice goddess, Toyuke Omakami. Um, but there's some one interesting thing about the Ise Shrine. In fact, I would say the most interesting thing that I haven't yet even mentioned, the most interesting thing about it, I think, is that ever since the 7th century ACE, so way back, you know, in the 600s, um, ever since then, the building, every building in the complex has been completely replaced every 20 years by exact replicas that are identical down to the last detail. Meaning that, you know, say there was like a, uh, you know, one major building that's part of the shrine, after 20 years is up and that cycle of time ends, they slide in a replacement for that building, which is an exact copy of the old one. So this is a shrine complex where all the physical buildings are constantly in a state of renewal with each new generation, a replica down to the wooden nails and everything is perfectly uh, replacing the old buildings. Um, so Issei is always being new. It's always renewed, but in the same old style. So it's sort of like at once old and new. You know, it kind of has that interesting dual quality. And um, that even has religious importance because it's believed within the tradition that this process of renewing the buildings causes the sun and rice goddesses to acquire new vitality with each renewal of the sacred shrines built to them. And that is supposed to help ensure the continuity of the imperial line of Japan but also the continuity of the successful harvest of rice. So those two things are thought to be absolutely essential for the survival and continuity of Japan and its people. Um, so this act of religious renewal of the shrine is supposed to be somehow uh, indirectly um, serviceable to that goal. When a 20 year cycle is nearing its end, the new replica buildings are built and they stand right next to the old ones. So for a brief moment of time, both are present in the same space. Um, but before they take down the old building, they first uh, transfer the sacred images and sacred iconography from the old structure into the new ones. And that's done in a very 
uh, formal ritual manner. It's ritually transferred by official Shinto priests into those new structures. Once the new structures are housing all of these important relics, images, and icons, then the old structures are removed. But even when they're removed, the old structures are still honored and respected. They're not just burned down or turned into dust. They are disassembled, but the pieces of them are thought to be infused with the power and the essence from those two goddesses. So the pieces are then uh, redistributed and sent to various shrines throughout Japan and built right into the walls of these lesser shrines. That means that it helps to fortify their spiritual power and also adds kind of religious grace and blessings to you know, a broader territorial domain than just the one Issei shrine itself. So um, I think that the shrine of Issei is interesting for one reason uh, among many. One of the reasons that I think it's interesting is because it reminds me a little bit of a philosophical thought experiment that is often discussed when people study metaphysics and philosophy. This is an example just briefly called the, uh, the ship of Theseus. <clears throat> The ship of Theseus. So I'm just going to make a brief little side comment about this uh, example. So imagine there's a ship that's made out of wood and um, kind of like the Issei shrine, it is going to be completely rebuilt plank for plank by identical wood. Okay. So we take one piece of wood out of the current ship of Theseus, we replace it with a new plank of wood, and we do this gradual replacement until all the pieces of the ship that were old are uh, no longer forming that ship and it's been replaced entirely by new pieces. Here's the question, is it the same ship? Um, or if it's not, then when did it stop being the first ship of Theseus and when did it start to become the second one? Can it survive the replacement of all of its parts and still be called the same ship? Um, that's an interesting question. It's sort of almost related metaphysically to the fact that, uh, like, say, a human being's body, all the cells in that body are completely replaced, say, every seven, eight, or nine years, something like that. So that means that in your lifetime, you've already exchanged all the physical particles that you had when you were born, and you no longer got any of the same, uh, at least physical material or mass, but yet you're the same individual. So it kind of presses us to think about conditions for persistence and identity over time. You know, is it the same um, Issei shrine as it was 50 years ago? Um, or does the replacement of the wood in the same standing position with the same architectural elements and, you know, purpose for, for being there, does that mean make it be the same thing? So is physical identity necessary for identity over time? Um, is that a requirement on a physical object or is it only a requirement on is it only a requirement on physical objects and not on human beings that have consciousness? I don't know. It's just interesting food for thought. Maybe I'll make one last comment on it before I move on. Suppose that you took the planks of wood from the old ship of Theseus that is being replaced, and then you rebuilt it in another area with the old wood. So the ship of Theseus is plank by plank replaced one at a time. Um, do you want to say that the old wood <laughs> that's standing in another location is the original ship? Or do you want to say that the same ship that's never left the harbor, because it was a piece by piece replacement, not just all at once, that that's the same ship of Theseus? I don't know. Now we have a sort of, you know, decision to make between which one is the closer continuer of the original. Or does the question not even make sense and neither one is original to the beginning? Or did the ship never exist in the beginning? No, these are puzzling questions about logic. But anyway, just a little interesting color and food for thought, but we can move on from that example now and get back to our lesson on these Japanese traditions. Okay, <clears throat> so the other most sacred um, uh, Jinja in Japan, that means Shinto Shrine, is the Izumo Shrine that I mentioned above there. Um, the Izumo Shrine is located in the Izumo region of Japan's southwest, and it's de dedicated to um, Okuni Nushi, that's the kami that's known as the lord of the country, or the god of the country. So, so one interesting thing about Shinto that I think I've mentioned before is that the kami that we speak of, these deities, these sort of ghost-like beings, they don't only correspond to uh, human beings, nor do they only correspond to um, 
beings that we would have a personal idea of, like a like a, in a form of a person. They can also be souls or ghosts of places, of times, of countries. Like like for example, Japan can have a kami of the country, and that's Okoninushi. Um, so that is a very important um, deity in the Shinto tradition, and the again shrine dedicated to them is Izumo. Izumo is also built out of wood, and it's often been rebuilt with the same design, kind of like the Ise Shrine, but not with the same exact regular intervals seen in the Ise Shrine. And again, we see elements of the Japanese preference for synthesis rather than conflict uh, among the various traditions, even in aspects of the architectural design of Otera and Jinja. In Japan, most Buddhist temples also house a small Shinto shrine within them. And the sacred architecture of Buddhist temples are largely imitated in Shinto shrines. So there's, again, a lot of cross-pollination, um, if you will, between the two traditions here, influencing each other in a lot of different big and small ways. One way that you can tell the two structures apart, though, is that the Buddhist temple is generally topped by that distinctive tiered pagoda that I showed you an image of just a while ago. For the Jinja, its most distinctive architectural element is this ceremonial gateway that people would see as they approach it. And the ceremonial gateway of the Jinja, it's called a tori. Okay, so. Okay, ceremonial gateway, that's the so-called tori. The basic structure of it is a pair of posts that are topped by two crossbars. Okay, so you got a pair of posts topped by two crossbars, uh, and the one crossbar extends farther out than the other. So actually there's a picture of one. Um, this is a famous floating ceremonial gateway uh, to the shrine of Itsukushima on uh, uh, Miyajima Island in the Bay of Hiroshima. So you see here that distinctive gateway type structure, two posts, um, and topping the post, you have two crossbars where the top bar is longer in its extension. Now, that tori type structure has a religious meaning as well. Um, the tori is supposed to be a symbol of the border between the impure, uh, you know, worldly, secular reality that we live in, and then the sacred and uh, sanctified divine realm that is within the shrine. So when you pass through the gate, uh, it's supposed to sort of represent you being cleansed of all the impurities of the outside world and entering into this uh, sacred sanctum of uh, religious importance. Once you're past that Tori, the main building in the Jinja is the main hall, which in this case is known as the Honden. Okay, Honden is the main hall of the Jinja. And uh, that main hall holds a sacred image of whatever kami the shrine is dedicated to. There's also a stone water tank, usually, and that's there for ritual cleansing. Uh, worshippers will cleanse their hands and mouth before entering to view the image of the kami. Another practice that is interestingly similar to those seen in the Hindu religious practice, where, um, you know, oftentimes people will engage in ritual cleansing. And we've also seen that in... Um, in uh, Islam and in uh, Judaism, uh, when prayers are given, oftentimes uh, some ritual cleaning will happen prior to those. Um, <clears throat> in addition to shrines and temples, there are also several sacred mountains of great importance to both Buddhist, Japanese, and Shinto traditions. Buddhism and Shinto have a common ground in sharing a sort of fascination with mountains and their majestic religious symbolism. Um, as we've discussed, Important Buddhist sects of Tendai and Shingon have headquarters on uh, mountains, Mount uh, Hai and Mount Koya, respectively. But the most famous of all sacred mountains in Japan is Mount Fuji, okay? Just putting the name there. Mount Fuji, or, you know, in Jap Japanese, San is the term for mountain, so Fuji-san is the way it would be referred to by a Japanese. Um... So Fujisan is itself um, regarded as a Shinto deity or kami. 
it's a site of mass pilgrimage that thousands of devout uh, worshipers travel to every year to worship and pray at the small Shinto shrine that is up at its peak. So at the peak of Mount Fuji, if you go all the way up there um, and you're a Shinto pilgrim, you can then pray at the Shinto shrine uh, at its top. It's also an important site for certain schools of Japanese Buddhism as well, including especially Nichiren Buddhism. Um, certain other uh, auspicious natural sites are also seen as sacred, such as the huge uh, Nachi waterfall in Wakayama, that's on Japan's east coast. Like Fujisan, the waterfall, Nachi, so I'll just give you the name, N-A-C-H-I in our alphabet, um, it's also seen as a powerful kami to Shinto's as well. So again, you see how there could be ghosts or deities associated with um, what, what a Westerner might call an inanimate object. Um, but it again shows the all-pervading thought about how there's um, spirits in everything. So it's kind of pan, um, pan psychism or pan uh, spiritualism at any rate, pan meaning everything. <clears throat> Okay, so now we finished our review of some of the more important sacred spaces of the Japanese traditions, and now I guess we're ready to turn our attention to the next thing, which are the sacred times of those traditions. So both major Japanese religious traditions uh, feature a great variety of festivals and rituals. Um, Japan abandoned the Chinese calendar for the Western uh, calendar, the Gregorian or sometimes called Julian calendar, on January the 1st of 1873. And ever since then, they've celebrated their own Japanese New Year uh, from you know, January 1st to 3rd, according to our same calendar. The name or word for the Japanese New Year is uh, Shogatsu Matsuri. Okay, Shogatsu Matsuri happens from January 1st to 3rd, and it's Japanese New Year. It's got some common features to Chinese New Year that we've spoken of before. As with Chinese New Year, one common um, practice is that people will do a deep clean of their house in the days leading up to the uh, New Year to have a kind of fresh start, to start things on a clean slate for the New Year. Also, there's a gathering of families, and families will eat a meal together and sometimes give gifts to their elders. Um, but the most important part is a visit to a shrine or a temple to make a, a humble offering to a deity or maybe just to pray for a good year full of uh, good health and uh, wealth and prosperity. Um, another widely celebrated holiday is uh, Oban. <clears throat> and Oban is the Buddhist celebration of uh, the annual return of ancestors to their ancestral homes. This happens in mid-August of each year. So. So it's the festival of ancestral return. It is believed that ancestors, either their souls or kami, um, return to the places where they dwelled in life. So on Oban, um, people will return to their own hometowns and they'll go to family gravestones and clean them and make them nice and tidy. And then they'll say prayers for the dead. Um, they then join in a traditional dance to honor the deceased ancestors. Um, Shinto see ancestors as kami. Buddhists see them as souls that are seeking salvation. But in Japan, both ideas are integrated together and accepted as one. Domestic ancestor rituals that are done at a person's home reflect this concern with deceased relatives, such as, for example, burning incense um, on the domestic Buddhist altar or um, making offerings at the Shinto kamidana which is uh, also in many Japanese homes. That's the word kamidana means a shelf of the gods or god shelf. Um, and that's a place where you're supposed to show your honor and respect to um, the various kami, either from your own family or others. In many homes, the kamidana is right there sitting above the butsudan in the same area. The butsudan is the, uh, the Buddhist uh, altar, the domestic Buddhist altar. And the Kamadana is the sort of Shinto domestic altar. And in many Japanese households, both are present. So it shows the kind of, again, syncretism, the synthesis of two traditions in one. Perhaps the most important specifically Shinto observance is the Matsuri festival. Okay, so <clears throat> let me tell you a little bit about that. 
Um, the Matsuri festival focuses on the shrine to the local Shinto Kami. There's two types of Matsuri. One is called Shadow Matsuri, and in that, a small portable shrine it, called a Mikoshi. So let me put that here. Okay, so it's like a little miniature looking shrine structure. Um, and it's, you know, paraded through the streets by various worshipers and Shinto devotees. Um, and it doesn't contain an image of the kami. This is actually to show reverence to the shrines themselves. The makoshi is empty that's being paraded around with no image of a kami inside of it. But then the second matsuri is known as the big festival. In Japanese, the term for that is tasai. Okay, and during the big festival, the Tasai, in this one, the Makoshi is paraded around the streets of the neighborhood or community again, but now it does contain the sacred image of the given local kami. Taisai occur every three years, uh, so it's a little bigger and there's a little bit more elaborate um, you know, festivities for it, and the Shadow Matsuri occurs annually, or in some communities biannually, but at any rate, more frequently than the Tasai. In these festivals, members of three major local organizations participate, organize, and lead the festivities. That's the Merchants Association, the Neighborhood Residents Association, and the Shrine Elders Association. So they all get to work together cooperatively, these important social um, organizations in the community, to put on this big festival. And that exhibits those different uh, organizations in a positive light for the community to see but it also reinforces and strengthens their bonds. So it's got a sort of dual purpose there. Um, many Japanese will also go to temples and shrines on their own without any uh, festival or community event, of course. Maybe that's just to seek blessings of a bosatsu or kami, or maybe they're dealing with a difficult uh, situation or moment in their life and they would like to seek grace or blessings from those kami or bosatsu. In that case, let me read you some of the ritual actions that a person could perform there. And we see some of this described on page 263. So I, I kind of just thought they had a nice written description of it here. And it says, um, in addition to participating in communal household rites and local festivals, a great many Japanese go to temples and shrines individually to seek the blessings of the local bosatsu or kami, especially when faced with a personal crisis. In a Buddhist temple, this usually involves burning a stick of incense as an offering to the deity and wafting the smoke over oneself. At a uh, shrine, the worshiper first performs a purifying ablution using water to cleanse oneself, rinsing out the mouth, washing the hands before approaching the outer part of the shrine and dropping an offering, sometimes money, into a collection box. Then, in order to alert the deity to his or her presence, the worshiper claps twice or pulls a rope to ring a bell or both. Next, with head respectively bowed and hands clasped, the worshiper makes a request for assistance. For example, a mother might ask the kami to help her child pass an exam. Other requests might include asking the kami to heal a sick infant or ensure the fertility of a marriage. The worshiper claps again to signify that the request has been made and leaves the shrine. If the request is granted, if we see the you know, good result following after that, good manners dictate that the petitioner returns back to the shrine and says thank you to the kami for their grace and for their benevolence okay so just a little window into some of those cultural practices and how people may actually um, uh, comport themselves inside of those shrines so um, <clears throat> aside from those big festivals and holidays there are also rites of passage an important rite of passage in the Shinto tradition is the birth ritual which is known as uh, omiyamari omiyamari Hmm. Um, and that translates directly as honorable shrine visit, but it's actually just a given name for um, the, <clears throat> the birth ritual. Um, so say a, a, a baby's born. After a few months, we take the infant, the family members, the parents will take the infant um, to a Shinto shrine. And uh, the baby will basically be purified by a Shinto priest. Um, 
extended family may attend the ritual as well to kind of um, welcome the child to the, the world and the community of the Shinto tradition. The ritual purification that is done for the child um, is oharai. Oharai, uh, ritual purification of an uh, infant child by a Shinto priest. If you'd like to know how that process plays out, let me read you a little bit of those details from the book. Um, Oharai, the act of ritual purification, forms a central part of most Shinto ceremonies. Waving a sacred branch of Sakakai, which is the prospering tree, um, an evergreen bush of the pine family, and chanting appropriate prayers, the senior priest of the shrine seeks to remove any spiritual pollution contaminating the person, place, or thing. I know I said there that it's purification of a child by a Shinto priest. I guess I should have been a little more precise. It's not necessarily only for children, although that's the most common case. In some cases, purification can also be done to uh, places, things, or adults. And um, I guess I should have mentioned that this is also a, a ritual that's done when married couples are getting um, their... Uh, marriage ceremony performed. So during marriage ceremonies, it's also done to the bride and groom by Shinto priests to again put blessings on their wedding and to try and ensure um, that it's going to be healthy and prosperous and long. Okay, so with that we've talked about the different uh, sacred times of the Shinto and Buddhist traditions of the Japanese religious landscape. We're going to just take a brief moment to talk about death in the afterlife. Um, we know already a lot about the views of death in the afterlife that we've learned from studies of Buddhism in previous parts of our course. So I want to just speak a little bit about the Shinto ideas of it. Now Shinto, as we noted in a previous meeting, has been called sometimes the life religion and Buddhism the death religion because of Shinto's general um, emphasis on worldly affairs and the uh, you know disposition of the person while they're alive, health, wealth, prosperity, fertility, um, family bonds and social bonds not as much what's going to happen to my soul in the afterlife, how do I escape, you know, rebirth and everything. But even though it is called a life religion, it does have ideas concerning death that are still significant and important. For example, in Shinto, the ancestral spirits of the dead are part of those who you have to make sure that you don't um, dishonor, who you don't um, lose face or tatame in front of. Um, so there's always this ever-present feeling that the dead um, – are people you have to honor, respect, and that are capable of blessing you or maybe um, burdening you or judging you. As such, the newly deceased are given offerings in the domestic Shinto shrine of the Kamidana. Now, one thing I thought that was pretty interesting about the Shinto belief system is that um, after 33 years, they say that the individual, um, <coughs> sorry, the individual kami of the person it merges with uh, all the other ancestral kami. So like individual identity is lost after the person is deceased for 33 years. I wonder if anyone has any thoughts about that. Is that like a, is that, does that still count as eternal life? Does the soul remain forever? Or does losing its individualism mean that it sort of ceases to have uh, any continuation into the future after that happens? I thought that was an interesting idea that individual identity is not necessarily the priority in this way of describing the metaphysics of the afterlife, it's ultimately a return back to the bigger system of kami that you came from, that you're a part of, but the individual's uh, own sense of identity is, is eliminated after a time period. As it says here, um, after 33 years, the spirit of a deceased ancestor is believed to lose its individual nature and to merge with the collective body of family ancestral spirits or kami, which are then said to dwell on a sacred mountain somewhere. So that would be like, I mean, you know, think of your family and you're just one member of that family. Suppose that this was true, then in the afterlife, you'd have a term of 33 years where you still maintain your individualism, but after that, you would just become blended somehow into the ancestral ghost uh, or the, the, the sum, the pool of kami that form your family's. Um, extended household. 
So that's just kind of an interesting different idea about the uh, death and the afterlife and what, what it amounts to. In Buddhist Japanese sects, death and the afterlife are more central uh, because, again, they focus on samsara and um, the elimination of negative karma to, to get to, to nirvana and to enlightenment. Now, Honen, uh, who talked about Pure Land Buddhism, he thought that it was almost impossible to achieve enlightenment and salvation on the basis of the hard path of meditation. Instead, he thought that faith would be the easier path to just declare faith in Amida Buddha. I want to say one more thing really quickly about the pure land itself, um, because sometimes people just have a mischaracterization of it that it's basically like heaven. You just say at the last moment of your life, I put my faith in Amida Buddha, and you wake up in the pure land, and now that's where you go, and you're just happy forever. It is supposed to be peaceful, serene, and blissful, the, the pure land. But it's kind of like a halfway point between regular life and heaven. Well, I shouldn't say heaven. Between regular life and um, permanent um, enlightenment and escape from reincarnation. Because when you're in the pure land, it's just very serene and peaceful. So you have better conditions to focus on achieving your salvation from there. Um, so the ultimate destination and goal is still to stop being reborn and reincarnated and to, you know, escape the perpetual cycle of life, death, and rebirth. As it says here in the book, um, <clears throat> for the Pure Land Buddhist sect, the route to salvation, nirvana, lies in rebirth in the Pure Land, a celestial region where, free from earthly disturbances, the deceased will be able to attain enlightenment and eventually nirvana. So it's, you're not quite achieving nirvana yet if you're in the Pure Land. It means you have still a little work to do now that you're there free from the trials and tribulations and turmoils of earth, you can actually focus on achieving nirvana in a more um, balanced, structured, and um, intensive way. So it says, the pure land is therefore a sort of halfway heaven between the pain and suffering of the mortal world and final and perpetual release. The key to being born in this paradise is absolute faith in the figure of Amida Buddha expressed in the utterance of the Nimbutsu. And again, the Pure Land Buddhism is the most uh, popular version of it that exists in Japan. So that's something to mention as we talk about death and the afterlife. Okay, and so now we finally come to the last component of today's meeting, um, wrapping up the Japanese religious traditions. And that is to talk just briefly about the relation of society and the Japanese religions. So ancient Japan, going way back in time, was structured by clans, ruling clans. That was the basic social unit. Shinto was rooted in this effort to uh, assign divine origins to the ruling clans of Japan, you know. But the clan system gave way eventually in around the 12th century ACE to extended households as the major unit of social organization. Feudalism took effect in the 12th century, so it stops being that clans are the primary uh, designated unit of, you know, social groups and etc and it's rather the extended household now. Today, respect and reverence for the extended family is deeply emphasized both in Shinto and Japanese Buddhism. As in many of the other world religions, there's not always been equality shown to both men and women in, in various uh, parts of the Japanese traditions too. That's in part due to the influence of rigid hierarchical Confucian social thought that influenced Japan, but to be fair, it's also just rooted in um, you know, general sociological patterns that we've seen internationally, not just in uh, owing to the influence of Confucius. Nonetheless, in recent years and generations, progress has been made. So for a long time, there were almost no Shinto priests that were women. But now uh, the percentage has increased substantially in the last generation or so. Buddhism, Japanese Buddhism, on the other hand, doesn't seem to have been quite as receptive to change, not as progressive on this gender equality issue in Japan as Shinto has been, because today there are still almost no Buddhist women priests. There are Buddhist nuns, but none that are like, um, you know, officials that oversee religious ceremonies or, or, or what have you, for the, or at least very few. Shinto, another thing to know about it is that um, it worked hand in hand to promote a kind of militant nationalism uh, during periods of time where the uh, the Japanese archipelago was engaged in major conflicts and wars. As you may know, unfortunately, Japan aligned itself with the uh, Axis powers during World War II and attacked the United States at Pearl Harbor, causing the United States to retaliate with um, 
atomic bomb attacks on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which vaporized and killed, you know, hundreds of thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people in a mere matter of seconds. Um, and no, that was way back in 1945, dropping two atomic bombs on major cities in Japan. It's never happened again that the atomic bombs have been used in war. Uh, but, you know, once was enough, probably. Everybody saw the destructive power for those. Maybe once was too much to many people's judgment. Um, there are always going to be more questions about whether it was truly necessary to use those weapons. But again, I'm talking to you about it only because in the Shinto religion, there's this linkage between the current imperial court and the ancient uh, uh, kami that are their divine ancestors. And so... Um, there's kind of like religious fervor, therefore, associated with absolute allegiance to and support for the ruling uh, powers that are the imperial powers. So part of that kind of like really uh, potent version of nationalist thought was used to help mobilize and organize military efforts when Japan was engaged in war in, say, World War II. But after the tragic results of the nuclear attacks against Japan, uh, they made major changes to their uh, social fabric. They <clears throat> created a, a new constitution that came into effect in 1947, two years after the bombs were dropped. And in that constitution, they stipulated that there could be no state involvement in religion. And so Shinto was kind of demoted from its position of centrality uh, that it had enjoyed for sure during the earlier generations and especially in the Shinto revival that happened in the late 19th century and then on into the 20th century. Many people thought, oh, Shinto is partially to blame for the kind of nationalistic fervor that led people to make decisions that ultimately ended up in these highly destructive attacks being waged against Japan. Um, you know, so a lot of people talk about uh, willingness to die for the sake of the uh, war effort, kamikaze fighters, um, which kami means ghost. Kamikaze actually means divine wind. It originally is rooted in a typhoon that was said to have prevented um, invading armies from defeating or conquering Japan. But the kamikaze method of attack is, you know, most Westerners think of it in terms of people flying planes into military targets, knowing that they would die in the process, but doing it to be more effective um, fighters, you know. Well, anyway, some people thought in the West that this absolute dedication to the emperor and this willingness to die for the sake of the war effort demonstrates uh, a dedicated enemy that will not surrender um, unless they're forced to reckon with a possible existential threat to their country. So, you know, some of the people that had decided to drop these bombs in the higher decision-making centers of the United States, you know, made these kind of arguments. And perhaps in response to some of those arguments, there was a major re-evaluation of the re connection between society and religion uh, subsequent to those attacks. So that's just an interesting fact to see the Constitution written anew um, with clear stipulations in there about not um, giving too much of a pride of place to religion out of perhaps fear that it could be harnessed in a way that could lead to other unwise, um, you know, international military decisions like those. So today, Japan's not at all a very militant country um, that uses an armed, a set of armed forces to enforce their will. Um, a lot of that has to do with the, uh, you know, the tragic events of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, something that historians and scholars will continue to discuss and debate. But, um, uh, we didn't have quite as much material to finish out the, the Japanese religious traditions with, so it's a little bit of a shorter meeting. I guess that's fine. Um, but I really appreciate you guys tuning in and watching this one. I'll be posting again soon. Um, on Wednesday, I'm going to post the next lecture. So it'll be about 48-hour turnaround. And then that's when we're going to start talking a little bit about the different arguments that have been given throughout history to try and prove or at least make a reasonable case that God exists. We'll see if these arguments have any credibility or if there's better objections to them or, or what. But for now, guys, uh, once again, I really want to thank you for attending. And uh, if you need anything, just don't hesitate to let me know. Make sure you're working on your essays and keep following our class announcements. Uh, I know it's been a long semester, but uh, let's not um, limp to the finish line. Let's sprint to the finish. We're almost there. We want to finish strong. But uh, we're all in this together. So thanks so much, and I will uh, talk to you guys soon. Okay, bye.